I would like to welcome everybody to the Middle East Institute National University of Singapore's webinar, Mercenaries or Private Contractors, Privatizing the State Monopoly of Violence from the Middle East and Beyond. As I just mentioned, all our three distinguished speakers have a long-standing boot-on-the-ground experience in security that range from the Middle East, Africa to Afghanistan, and uh, uh, basically, I'm the only one in this group uh, with zero practical experience. So having said that, uh, I can only do one thing, uh, and this thing is stop speaking and start uh, uh, to kickstart with the first question. Sean, uh, in our previous podcast uh, at MEI, Boots of the Ground, uh, we have been talking uh, about the role of private military in supporting uh, uh, army military action in Iraq and then in Afghanistan. Uh, nowadays, in the Middle East and uh, in uh, North Africa, there is uh, an increased use of mercenaries. And uh, this is a trend. And in your opinion, this trend is going to cross uh, the Middle East border? Thank you. The floor is yours, Sean. Right. So in the last 10 years, we've seen private military contractors morph from a U.S. and coalition operation in Iraq and Afghanistan to a much more free market for force where we see mercenaries. And we'll leave for a slide the difference between a mercenary and a private military contractor for Jamie and other much more smarter guys than myself to unravel. But we're seeing this already. We're seeing um, mercenaries in Ukraine, obviously Iraq, Syria, and Yemen, but in Nigeria, we're seeing them in Mozambique, we're seeing them in Libya. In fact, the, the conflict in Libya is very much a mercenary on mercenary fight, like we'd see something out of the European Middle Ages. Uh, we're seeing mercenaries in Venezuela. Um, so what we're seeing is, is the globalization of mercenaries in conflict zones around the world. Uh, and some countries like Russia are using mercenaries as a new weapon of choice. They're using groups like the Wagner Group from Mozambique through Africa all the way to Libya. Uh, it's the first time Russia has done expeditionary warfare in Africa since the Cold War. And they're using mercenaries because one reason mercenaries are attractive to a lot of organizations in the world is that they give you some plausible deniability. So if you want to wage war in secret, mercenaries are a good and cheap way to do it. The reason why that matters is because we live in a global information age where weapons that give you plausible deniability like mercenaries are more effective than old fashioned firepower. So yeah, so the last 10 years we've seen the expansion of mercenaries well beyond the Middle East. It's become a trend. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, you've been very diplomatic, giving the most difficult uh, question uh, to, to Jamie. And uh, I, I will try to share the, the burden asking uh, to, to Doug. Uh, uh, in terms of definition, later on we are going to try to define uh, mercenary, private military, and private security. But uh, from uh, an uh, operational point of view, and we are talking about international stability operation industry, what's the difference between uh, international private security industry and international stability operation industry? And uh, if you can let me add, uh, if you can see if there is a kind of evolution for uh, stability operation industry from Iraq uh, to Afghanistan. Doug, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks for having us today. It'll be an interesting discussion. Uh, just real quick, my perspective today is my own perspective, uh, not the, that of the uh, stability operations industry. Um, just giving my own thoughts uh, based on my time as an academic first and then running the trade association. Um, but the larger stability operations industry includes any sort of private company that works in a complex environment uh, or um, basically uh, anywhere where you have a conflict going on. And, uh, the industry itself generally works for uh, international organizations or governments. It can be split up into sort of logistics companies, security companies, um, companies that do security sector reform and development and essentially 
create a new state where there had uh, where one had collapsed before, uh, and organizations that support the industry, law firms, insurance firms, consultants. The, the biggest part of the stability operations industry is, in fact, uh, the logistics and support companies. The logistics companies are by far the largest um, construction companies. And one thing to keep in mind for all these companies is the vast majority of their employees are actually local nationals. So when we get into the terminology aspect of what is a mercenary and stuff, we need to keep in mind that there's a very large legitimate industry that largely uses locals to do most of the work. And when you're looking at a peacekeeping or stability operation, the people who should be doing the work, who should be doing the security and the reconstruction, should probably be the locals. And so that's actually a model that's worked rather well. And while the numbers or the percentages of these uh, stability operations, whether you're talking um, Libya or uh, going back to Sierra Leone or whatever, the, the, the growth in this industry has really come in the fact that the, the international community recognizes the value of the private sector, the expertise it brings in in all these sectors. Uh, so you're actually seeing more and more of these companies being involved in it and the size of the operations growing. Although the size of the industry grows and shrinks depending on, uh, on demand and it was much larger back during the days of Iraq. Um, now it's a, a smaller industry, but still uh, it's able to expand as required for the next stability peacekeeping operation that goes on in the world. The security companies are maybe they go from anywhere to five to 15% of the industry, depending, depending on the level of risk that's going on in a particular peacekeeping operation. And I think it's important to keep in mind that a private security company is very different from a private military company. Um, and a lot of it comes down to why do you hire? Uh, for a private security company, essentially you're hiring something that is a, a company that is protective and defensive. As we say, it's, uh, it's protecting the noun, it's protecting a person or place or thing that it has been hired to protect. Uh, the security companies can be armed or they can be unarmed, but they operate legally. They operate legally under the host government. They operate legally under the country where they originate from. And they have a very different role from how you would use a military in a peacekeeping operation. So there's, there's a sort of separate industry here that, or there's a separate factor or aspect that I think Sean talks about, which is much more of a uh, ungoverned aspect of, of uh, security than what we talked about with the standards of private security companies. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, and on this, I think you kick-started the, the next question to Jamie, uh, that is uh, basically, uh, as uh, we already know, everybody know what is uh, how to define mercenary in broader term, but when you need to define it uh, in very precise legal term, uh, there is uh, an increasing gray area, and uh, as is usually you know, gray area is prone to abuse. Uh, in this respect, uh, Jamie, I would like uh, to make you the to make the one million dollar question. You have five minutes to define private military security, mercenary, and private security and private card. And uh, thank you for that. Uh, thanks, Alex. And uh, thanks for organizing this uh, webinar. And I'll give you my sort of bank details in a few minutes for that $1 million if I succeed in the five minutes. Um, I think it's just to sort of rebound on both Sean's uh, as well as Doug's initial comments. And uh, I think the point that you made as well with regard to the gray area uh, that we're speaking about. I come from the perspective of working specifically on um, private security companies on sort of the oversight uh, capacity build and accountability in particular of private security companies and previously worked of course uh, with the International Committee of the Red Cross with armed carriers be they state or non-state armed carriers and I think the three sort of uh, or four main elements I would you know consider we should look at uh, when we are in this kind of discussion is you know questions of oversight accountability transparency and to me, moving away from sort of the labels to understand what we're speaking about in terms of actors. And I think that's particularly important when we want to focus on that responsible security or that level of, um, you know, transparency that's required in this uh, sort of environment. Let's unpack this a little bit. And you asked me to look at the sort of legal framework in particular. The label mercenary, unfortunately, is being, I think, uh, tabbed onto anything which is deemed security or military and quite often in armed conflict situations. Uh, 
there was an article recently uh, in sort of, I think, the Economist magazine, and you'll see it in many other areas where they use the term mercenary loosely to effectively cover everything which goes from a spectrum of security contractors in a very basic sense, i.e. an unarmed security personnel standing guard out of an NGO, uh, outside an NGO facility in Kenya, all the way through to uh, Wagner group type uh, elements. And that label is just thrown out there to try to cover everything. And that thing does more of a disservice than a service in terms of what we're trying to achieve. And I think what we all agree that we need to do. So the legal framework is quite simple. If we're speaking about mercenaries, you have your United Nations Convention from 1989 or thereabouts, about 36 state parties that came into effect a few years later. You also have the uh, African Union or the OAU as, well, as it was then. Uh, sort of convention on mercenarism, likewise a similar number of uh, state parties to the UN uh, convention from 1989. And both those treaties are, I think, very much inspired from the 1977 additional protocol one to the Geneva Conventions, quite legalistic, but as a definition put forward uh, from a protective, a kind of a humanitarian perspective initially, to say individuals who are involved in armed conflicts who are not fighting on behalf of one or the other armed forces, not being fully integrated into the armed forces or one of the parties to the armed conflict, they will not have the same immunities and privileges as legitimate combatants. Simple. So they won't be treated as prisoners of war. And that was sort of Geneva Convention of humanitarian perspectives. The AU Convention and the UN Convention will very much focus on saying also the legality or illegality of mercenaries and mercenarism as such, focusing on at what point can we say that certain types of actors have gone beyond what is lawful in their actions, in particular in armed conflicts, and it was focused around sort of the post-colonial era and questions of uh, wars of national liberation and the likes. A couple of challenges with definitions put forward in those early instruments for mercenarism, very long-winded, a big focus on direct participation in hostilities, on which has been quite a lot of interpretation and back and forth amongst experts for many years, uh, but nonetheless a very narrow set of actors that were contemplated through those uh, conventions. Fast forward, you don't have much more in terms of the hard treaty law uh, that looks at PMSCs. I think we will see the rise of the term PMSC or sort of in sort of the Montreux document from 2008 or thereabouts where suddenly we put into the same hat military contractors and security companies. Even though, as I think both Sean and Doug quite rightly pointed out, there's a spectrum of services being offered. At one end of the spectrum, the kind of security companies I'll speak about, the main focus of the work that we have with the association. And at the other end of the spectrum, military type contractors offering defense industry kind of support, uh, train and equip, logistics, intelligence, uh, manning, FOBs, and the likes. And they're more sort of the military side and less in the sort of security side and sense of the international code of conduct. And I dare say for both of those, sort of the, on the spectrum, you do have that gray area, as you rightly pointed out, Alex. The further you go towards kind of the military side, the more gray areas is between security and military. And you have some large companies that offer both sets of services. And then the further you go down the military spectrum, the closer you might get to the so-called mercenary type activities. And there's a certain gray area there. And Sean mentioned the Wagner Group earlier in terms of you know, how do you label that particular entity? The other set of, I think, uh, instruments to look at uh, beyond the International Code of Conduct, which is specifically addressing the conduct of security contractors in complex environments, not military companies as such, you need to look at two other processes uh, in front of the United Nations. So you have a United Nations Working Group on Mercenaries, which is looking at mercenaries, and more recently also looking at security companies and military contractors. But they have made a distinction between mercenaries on one side and a security and military on the other side. And there's still some blurring in terms of discussion between military and security in the reports coming from the UN Working Group, even though the recent report on Switzerland uh, was a bit more nuanced. And then you have also an open-ended intergovernmental working group, which is developing a regulatory framework through the United Nations and before the Human Rights Council right now to look at pragmatic implementation of how you deal with security companies. The Montour document, the UN Working Group of Mercenaries, the open-ended intergovernmental working group, the International Code of Conduct have all driven, I think, over the past few years to try to move away from these labels and be a bit more specific in terms of what do we need to look at in terms of oversight, accountability and transparency is very much focused on the services, the types of services that these entities are offering. And from then, we can determine what is the appropriate legal framework that applies to those services. 
Alex, I'll stop there to stay within the five minutes. Thank you, Jamie. Luckily, uh, you went a little bit over the five minutes because the answer was perfect, uh, but uh, for a matter of time, I cannot pay you the one million. But uh, I would like to revert to what you just mentioned at two point, uh, is uh, accountability and legitimacy. And uh, the, the Wagner Group name already came out, uh, uh, for example, uh, from Syria, uh, to Libya, and now even in Mozambique, uh, there was a call for action for the Russia Wagner Group. Uh, in, uh, in your opinion, uh, and this question is open to both uh, Doug and, uh, and Sean, uh, how we can try to classify this new actor, and there are even other new actors, for example, the Chinese private security company that are mostly used to guard uh, uh, project infrastructure and personnel along the Belt and Road Initiative. So, floor is back to you, Doug or Sean, your call. Um, I'll go first, I guess. Uh, when you talk about Wagner Group, and there's actually several Russian actors that are similar to that, um, I think most academics would actually classify them as state actors, even though they are technically private companies. Um, the way they are used essentially is with the express or implied permission of the Russian government. And one would expect that uh, in terms of holding them accountable, you'd have to actually work through the Russian government on that. Um, I think in the past, there were some precedents for this. If you look at uh, Bob Denard from the 1860s and 1970s, he was essentially an arm of the French government. Almost everything he did uh, essentially had the, the, the uh, preordained blessing from the French government. So. There's something like that, but I, I think it's very different from a in, from a company or a private company that's trying to operate legally and professionally. It's it has a different role and it has a different level of protection. Maybe Sean can expand it. Right. Well, this is where I might diverge with my colleagues a little bit on on uh, the Wagner Group. So Russia calls the Wagner Group a PMC, a private military contractor, but most observers think of them as mercenary. Um, and it's ironic because the United States 15 years ago called the, you know, Blackwater a private military company, but many international observers thought of them more like mercenaries. And this is, this is part of the problem of labels. Uh, to me, there is, there is certainly gray area, but sometimes are used surely as euphemism. I think Moscow uses the term private military company as, a, as euphemism. And yes, they may be a state actor today, but we don't know where they'll be tomorrow, right? So Eric Prince, who's the founder of Blackwater, used to wrap himself in the American flag when he had an American contract. But when he left Blackwater, uh, he ended up working for all sorts of places like UAE, China. He works for China today, uh, doing Belt Road Initiative work. Um, so I think the the concept of legitimacy tied to states to me is less compelling than what are these people actually doing on the ground? Thank you very much to, to all of you. Uh, and uh, now I think we can start uh, to open uh, the, the question to our public. As I mentioned before, if you want to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand uh, and mute yourself uh, and use your webcam or just send uh, uh, via Zoom chat uh, uh, your question and, uh, and I will read it. So let me see, uh, first one. Okay, uh, this is open uh, to all uh, of, the, uh, of the speaker. Uh, kidnapping from ransom is a present threat to multinational invest in, the, in complex environment. Do security companies have a legitimate role, also we talk about legitimacy again, in providing negotiation and rescue services? That's quite a dedicated question. It's open to you. I guess I can start. Um, Please, Doug. There's a sector of industry called uh, K&R, Kidnap and Ransoming. Um, and there's a number of security companies that are actually quite old in some cases that have been doing this sort of work. And essentially you will uh, either as a, a business or whatever, you will buy an insurance policy with one of these companies or maybe part of your insurance policy. And if any of your executives or personnel are kidnapped, um, this company will come in and 99% of the time it's a negotiating process. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Proof of Life, I think from the 80s, uh, it sort of covers a... Um, 
particular case that, that did happen, although a lot of it is uh, fictionalized. Um, so that is a legitimate part of the industry. And again, there are rescue services, though uh, very, very rare. I don't know how many actual rescues have been done. More often than not, it's simply a negotiating process with the kidnappers. See, Jamie, Sean, you want to add something? Beside the fact that, um, that make very good plot for movie. No, I mean, not a huge amount to add there. I think uh, the point uh, potentially look at here is a question of the uh, rescue services component. I think, as Doug uh, rightly mentioned, you know, so 99% is through negotiation. But when there is a rescue service, that's when you have to have sort of the initial questions in terms of what action is contemplated, um, what kind of rescue mission is put in place, the jurisdiction in which the operation takes effect, and then the sort of precautions that go with it. You know, how much force is that particular entity allowed to use? And are there so-called so rescue missions carried out in combination with local law enforcement or with, let's say, local militaries that may be in a particular jurisdiction. I think that's where it becomes a bit more tricky in terms of the protection of the individuals and the responsibility if something goes wrong, but also in terms of the SOPs and the uh, rules and use of force and engagement. Thank you. Uh, on this, while we wait for the next question, I have one that is, uh, again, open to all the three of you. Uh, and. Uh, it's kind of a tricky question. Is the private security sector more efficient and accountable than the public security sector? And we can start with Sean. And I already see you smiling. <laughs> I think that's... Well, sometimes I, I ask people, would you rather be taken uh, as a prisoner of war by, say, Blackwater or Sudan, right? I mean, um, I, I and if you look at the work of private military or, uh, I'm using the word very loosely. Uh, look at, for example, the working of executive outcomes in the 1990s in Africa. For years, the, the civil war in, in Angola was grinding on. For years, uh, the RUF uh, ruled parts of Sierra Leone and committed some of the worst human rights abuses in the world. Uh, and the international community could not or would not stop it, in comes executive outcomes, and they stop it within weeks. For years, the Nigerian military could not contend with Boko Haram. Uh, and uh, in 2015, private military actors came into Nigeria, worked with the Nigerian military, and they pushed Boko Haram out of Nigeria, or substantial amounts of it, in weeks. Um, so, you know, I, I think actions speak louder than words. Uh, Doug, let, let me jump on you with this because uh, Sean mentioned at the two word executive outcome. So I think you, you can move from there and go to Nigeria and Boko Haram. I don't know if I would go to Nigeria or Boko Haram. That was an interesting <laughs> case. It was, that one was indeed was a few short weeks. Uh, I should mention that the, uh, that the South Africans company worked with a Nigerian unit. Um, as they do. Uh, and uh, so they actually acted as a force multiplier. I think in terms of the cost effectiveness of these companies, I mean, any of these companies in the stability operations industry, the reason you use them is because they're faster, better, or cheaper, or some combination, or maybe all three of those. Uh, and I think there are other uh, cases where they make a lot more sense. For example, um, at one point at the peak of the Afghan conflict, the US was spending about a million dollars per uh, soldier that they had deployed in Afghanistan. I mean, the US doesn't do this sort of stuff cheap. Uh, local private security costs you maybe 400 or $500 a month. Uh, so it's obviously a lot cheaper and maybe some of the roles, it just makes more sense to go private. For example, if you've just rebuilt as in uh, Iraq at one point, they rebuilt a, a sewage treatment plant uh, as part of the reconstruction. Uh, do you want regular military people protecting this brand new sewage treatment plant from the insurgents? Uh, it seems crazy that if you actually had casualties, you have to write home to the parents of uh, of the casualty and say, hey, yeah, this person was doing a really important United States job protecting a sewage plant. Uh, the reality is for something like that, a private security company that hires locals and trains them up uh, is a much better option. And in terms of accountability, when you have private security, well, you can fire a company, you can fire a company like Blackwater, as happened. Um, you can't fire the United States Marine Corps. Um, there are, there's a difference. So you have this automatic accountability in also, it's much easier to hold private individuals uh, to law. And in fact, several Blackwater individuals are, are in prison for what happened in Iraq you know, back in 2007. 
you know, to this day. So there's a, in terms of accountability, cost effectiveness, I think there's a lot of reasons. Uh, there are times that I think public forces or regular militaries make a lot more sense um, and uh, have a lot more legitimacy. And that's, that's that. But I'm just, you know, I think in terms of the question, I mean, in general, you're going to get a, a much more uh, cost effective business by going to or cost effective solution by going to private sources. Jamie, you want to jump, jump in? in there. Yeah. Please. No, definitely. And again, I mean, I just want to make sure that we are not putting the, the, the entire discussion into one hat, speaking about the sort of military type security operations. Uh, when I uh, listen to the question, I immediately, my reflex is much more in terms of sort of the classic security setups that we are um, looking at in complex environments. Now, if you would ask me a choice between um, public law enforcement agencies, local police and the likes in complex environments, we have weak governments, potential security vacuums over a well-regulated, properly licensed security company, uh, be they armed or unarmed, I think the the gut feeling may be moved towards the security contractor because you do have a professional entity that can provide you security, not in a military sense. I'm talking in terms of the self-defense, protection of property, protection of individuals. And you see that recourse uh, by many entities in complex environments, uh, not just you know conflict situations, but also high risk environments. There are a number of countries out there which are unstable and the range of clients, be they NGOs, humanitarians, United Nations agencies, extractive industry, et cetera, in many of these environments, they immediately gravitate towards the security contractors, private security companies to provide security. They do not depend solely on the local law enforcement agencies to provide that security. And it may be because of choice, it may seem because of the lack of capacity, but in some of these environments, you'll find that the local law enforcement agencies themselves are either operating well below capacity or may have very limited training and themselves may be providing you more risk than actually safeguards if you use them. So I think the, it very much depends on a case by case basis what we're speaking about here. And certainly I would, again, separate the discussion with regard to security in terms of security companies from, I think, the security in terms of military type of security operations that maybe I think Doug was alluding to in his answer. No, I, I totally agree uh, on this uh, point, but I think uh, the, the other speaker too can see on that. I see that our audience is still a little bit shy, so I'm keeping receiving questions. Uh, but please, uh, you can also ask it directly. Uh, one question is from Sean McMurty. The private sector currently contributes significantly to wider industry regulation. Could large multinational use their leverage in complex environment to promote positive change? I'm quite happy to tackle that question. Certainly, I think yes. Um, I think we need to look at supply chain and so management security in that particular supply chain and the incentives, be they commercial or reputational and the likes. The trends that we have uh, looked at, so if you consider the fact that the International Code of Conduct itself was adopted in 2010, the Montreux document that we mentioned earlier was adopted in 2008. The Montreux document very much built uh, its sort of parameters and references and best practices around the experiences in Iraq in particular and to some extent Afghanistan during the coalition conflicts there and the experiences in particular of military type contractors less security companies. With the code of conduct being adopted I think the initial focus in 2010 was similarly on those kinds of entities. Moving fast forward you know 10 years the landscape has evolved and from an association perspective, we look at complex environments and in complex environments, you have a range of actors that I've mentioned already, but there's a large business component as well. So you have major commercial entities operating in many of these high risk slash complex environments, which includes major multinationals and the extractive industry, uh, for instance, or breweries. We've mentioned you know, a few in a few web previous webinars and likes, and they of course will be using security. And both in their choice of security provider, but also in terms of the demands that they place on the security providers, who these days in many environments, I'd say are majority local security providers, they can play a major role in ensuring that those security providers are operating to internationally recognized standards. It's not only to the benefit of the security provider to be operating that standard, but it's clearly a benefit to the major client because it works up the supply chain. 
If something goes wrong, there's that due diligence element that has to sit in the supply chain of the major client. And then we've seen, for instance, a couple of cases recently not linked to security, but linked to other issues where investors may start having a major role to play in terms of holding to account the multinational, the board of directors, the chief executive officer for shortcomings anywhere down the supply chain. And I dare say over the next few years, well, I hope so anyway, we're going to see more of a focus on security matters uh, in the supply chain in these complex environments. Thank you, just Thank you add on to that. Please, please that. Just, floor is your... Yeah, if I could just add on. I think there's a real aspect here that is driven by the clients. Uh, the industry is happy to be operated at a very high level, but if you have clients that are essentially going for the cheapest company they can find, they're going to lose a lot of the uh, this work that's been done by the industry, by the international community, by the NGOs to essentially set standards and, and, and uh, guides. Um, ISOA or IPOA as originally was had a code of conduct that it was built around um, that all those companies were willing to follow. And ICOCA obviously is a much more uh, elaborate aspect of this. There's an incredible capability for these companies to uh, do this sort of global governance on their own or with, uh, I should say, uh, in conjunction with the uh, international community. Uh, but you're still getting a lot of clients, and this includes governments, that are simply going for the, the lowest price they can get. And you lose a lot of, the, of what's been done, a lot of this capability that's been developed. Yeah, the, the, the pricing issue, still it's a market, so it's a, it's quite a big issue from, from personal experience on the Chinese side. There is also the blame that they try to find a private security firm with the lowest budget and then the, the problem of capabilities. It's, a, it's another problem. I don't know, Sean, if you have something on this question or we can move on to the next one. Just briefly, I totally agree with Jamie and Doug. Um, I might even go further by saying the private sector and especially extractive industry might drive industry behavior through their market power uh, in ways that go beyond state norms and state control. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I just think that the private sector and multinationals have, will have more influence in this industry in the decade ahead. Thank you, Sean. Uh, I move on with the next question. I have already Can several... Oh, please, Doug. One addition on that, there's something called the Voluntary Principles on Security and Human Rights, which was developed uh, through the extractive industry, and it addresses some of the points I think that Jamie and Williamson brought up, um, that effectively, uh, in effect, extractive companies and NGOs, the fairly radical NGOs in their early days, got together and said, there's a whole bunch of things we can agree on in terms of how to do security. And they created some guidelines as well that I think are well worth uh, looking at, especially for research. Thank you. I will just follow with the next question. But uh, as questions are keeping arriving uh, in a written form, uh, I, I still encourage our audience if they want to ask directly. I'm sure in the last 40 minutes you realize that I have a, a terrible Italian accent when I speak in English. So it would be even easier for our guests to answer you directly. But now we have a question from RKRA. Will the same concern that affect the private security sector in the Middle East affect private security contractors role in emerging domains like South China Sea? If not, then will would be some concern in those areas? Sean, you want to give it a try? Sure, I'll start. Um, well, South China Sea is an interesting case uh, because it's maritime and there are not that many maritime security contractors. There are, I mean, Jamie can certainly tell you much more about that than me. Um, and they're not exactly based on the privateer model of old. Um, but maritime security, in my experience, is a little bit more, uh, it's a different type of technical and cost than sort of land-based private military contractors. But answering your question writ large, I think yes. I think the industry has really gone global. It's not just a Middle Eastern phenomenon or South Asia phenomenon. We're seeing the industry reemerge all over Africa, both North and, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, we have examples like in Venezuela, the Bay of Piglets with the American former Green Beret. Uh, but nobody should, have the false security that you know mer mercenaries and i'll call him a mercenary like that are sort of a uh, 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 uh 
think a, a, a ludicrous villain. Uh, there are bounty, you know, the U.S. government puts bounties on heads of heads of states like Maduro in Venezuela, and my concern is that attracts the flies, if you will. That attracts more mercenary activity, and I'm using mercenary not um, in a very specific manner there. But yeah, I do I do believe that as the industry you know, expands, it will find new conflict markets and uh, the rules of the road will change in, in, I think, surprising ways at times. Okay, I think uh, we can make the next question from Hema. Based on the discussion and your analysis, how would you situate the Nepalese Gurkha who have been traditionally recruited by the UK? They have been criticized for their divided national loyalties. Would you classify them as mercenaries or as a private military contractors? I guess I'll, I'll answer part of that, but without answering the military, I mean, as far as I can see, there's nothing private military about them. You know, they're integrated into the armed forces uh, of another sort of uh, country, but they're certainly not security contractors in the sense of the international code of conduct. I think that's particularly important to note. Um, the, 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 to answer a question with a question um, or, uh, is, you, know, you need to look at the level of integration, the command and control. Have those individuals uh, that are operating on behalf of another country and have they been integrated into that chain of command? Uh, do they serve under the flag? Do they wear their uniforms? So all the criteria you have on the Geneva Conventions are essential in that regard. If they fulfill that criteria, then they're part of that uh, sort of armed force as such, and they have to fulfill the requirements on the Geneva Convention and international humanitarian law. If, however, you find entities that fall outside of that criteria set, then you have potentially something which is more on the private side. But as far as I know, uh, the Gurkhas are formally integrated and the recognition goes with it. If I could add on to that, the um, uh, former British uh, military Gurkhas that have retired out of the military are in high demand in the uh, private security industry. Um, they're, they're very good, they're very professional. Uh, they're already well trained, they speak English. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons that there's some value there. But I think when you get into that kind of question, you're getting into this sort of loosey goosey term of mercenary because, again, we have a very, I think, a detailed definition of what a mercenary is. But the reality is the way it's used by the media, by, by um, some of the press, is uh, basically a, a mercenary is a business person or a foreigner that we don't like. And that's really what it kind of boils down to. And there's no really good definition of what it is. It's just a derogatory term. Uh, and it's often used in cases like the, the British Gurkhas, and I think that's unfortunate. Uh, Sean, if you don't want to jump in, I move with the next question. That is from Bob Park from King's College London. Do outcome or service required by contract provide a useful way of establishing clearly definable boundaries that might be used to regulate PSC by, for example, international convention? So just to be clear, Bob, the question is, do the outcomes on the ground of these firms, is that a, a better way to think about typology of these services? I see here, or services required by contract provide a useful way of establishing clearly definable boundaries. And it mentioned PSC, not PMC. I think I'll leave the PSC question to my colleagues who... <laughs> Much more. Well, Sean, Sean, if you can hear me, it's, it's either PSCs or PNCs. Just ah, a no. question of whether uh, the, the, if you have a state that is contracting either a PSC or a PNC um, to provide specific outcomes, um, can you actually use those outcomes there uh, to categorize um, uh, uh, the PSC? And could you actually use the outcomes, in other words, the services that are being provided as, as a useful and a clear way of establishing boundaries that might hold these companies to account? So, Bob, it's a great question. And um, in my original book, The Modern Mercenary, I actually created typology based on uh, function of these organizations based on their outcomes. And I sort of model that on how, you know, 
know, com, you know, combat versus combat service versus combat service support, which is how, for example, the U.S. Army thinks about itself. Um, and I think it, it can provide um, some modicum of typology. There are problems with that typology, but frankly, there are problems with every typology out there. And international law gives us uh, some typology, as Jamie and Doug have already alluded to. But the, my, the challenge I see with that is that this industry is moving beyond the reach of international law. Uh, we're getting to an era of, I think, where we should not be privileging states in international affairs, that multinational corporations and others also have a political voice, whether it's codified or not, and they are shaping this market. We had an earlier question, I don't know if it was from Sean McMultrie or somebody else about, um, you know, how can multinationals and extractive, how can they influence and shape the industry? And they already are. So um, anyway, that's my, my two cents. Alex, I'm going to jump in there. And um, uh, Bob, no, definitely. I think it's a good, it's a good question. If you look at the approaches taken in the Montreux document, uh, that was quite specific uh, to the extent that uh, they took a pragmatic approach. Now, we need to remind ourselves that the Montreux document was very much focused on armed conflict situations with a kind of a humanitarian law perspective uh, rather than a human rights perspective and sort of commercial perspective. And they clearly uh, you know, indicated that you need to take a case by case basis to determine status of those companies and individuals. And much of it would be predicated on the sort of services approach. Uh, likewise, the uh, United Nations Open-Ended Intergovernmental Working Group, which sat last year in 2019 in its initial report, similarly looked at a services approach to distinguish between the so-called military type uh, companies and services being offered and the, from the security type of entities are being offered. And going back to you know, the picture I was trying to draw with my hand virtually uh, in front of the screen, there is that spectrum naturally that you will find a one side of the spectrum, a set of services which are clearly security in the traditional sense. By that I mean a guard offering uh, personal or facility type protection uh, in the sense of you know, self-defense kind of approach. But there will be companies that can have more of a, let's say offensive posture as such. And then you're moving more towards a military type of setup. So at some point, um, yes, the, I think the services approach is very important, but there will be some gray areas uh, as well. There was a huge discussion a few years ago when the new and working group of mercenaries tried to issue a first, well, they actually did put forward a first draft convention uh, to deal with mercenaries, I think PMSCs. And that, and if there's anyone from the UN working group listening now or in a recorded version, uh, this is said objectively, but that, uh, that draft uh, fell by the wayside fairly quickly because a lot of folk uh, focus on the question of what constitutes an inherently governmental function. In other words, our questions, again, focused on services. And the idea was to say there are certain functions which governments cannot outsource. So I wasn't looking at sort of uh, commercial entities, wasn't looking at private entities or NGOs hiring private security companies, looking more at sort of the military type kinds of operations being carried out and what could be outsourced. So, for instance, uh, detention of POWs. Um, uh, issues of interrogations and the like were deemed to be inherently governmental functions. But it was, became virtually impossible to come up with a, a list that everyone would agree to because some governments saw certain functions as not necessarily being inherently governmental, whereas others did. And so the convention stalled and there are, you know, drives by the UN Working Group to have this treaty put back out there again, redraft in one form or another. So the services approach is valid. Uh, and I think it's particularly important if you want to categorize individuals and the kind of legal framework that would regulate their behavior, capacity, oversight, and so on. If I could weigh in as well on the, on the contract issue, I think contracts are incredibly important to this industry and how they're written is really important. And they essentially go beyond law. So the law will say you can do this, you can't do this. The contract can go into much more detail. And as we saw, I've seen over the time, um, the contracts can actually be modified quicker than the laws and modifications can be put in there. As I say, you know, if you want to put in a rule in your contract that your private security can only wear pink paisley pajamas, uh, any company that's going to bid on that contract has to agree to that clause from the beginning. So it's a very quick way to essentially make sure that these companies operate in the way you want them to operate. Thank you, Doug. On this, we have a quite long question from Dr. Carlos Ortiz. 
there is a recent, a recent trend to call companies originating in some non-Western country as mercenaries, particularly Russia and uh, Western firm as PMC and PSC. I find this slightly counterproductive as the private security military is global in scope and this trend undermine aspiration to universal regulation principle. Example, regulation that apply to firms, personnel, regardless of the country they originate, Western or non-Western. Any of? Sure, I agree with Dr. Ortiz uh, completely. I mean, look at the question of Blackwater versus uh, Wagner Group. I mean, U.S. likes to call Blackwater mercenaries, whereas Moscow calls, you know, Wagner Group PMCs. I think some of these labels are largely euphemism used by, for convenience rather than principle. Um, and I, uh, what is Wagner doing in, Wagner Group doing in Africa? Largely the same things that U.S. private military firms have been doing, such as professionalizing uh, foreign, you know, foreign forces. Now, what they're doing in Libya is more traditionally mercenary, and I don't think any American private military company did that, uh, as Doug will remind me. So there may be some lines there, but I think some of these labeling is, is counterproductive uh, because it's used for political expediency that can sometimes be hypocritical. If uh, you want to jump in, otherwise there is uh, another question that quite linked with this one in terms of label. It's from Vanessa Gottwick. In terms of accountability, what do you think about PMC just rebranding when they experience damage to their reputation, such as Blackwater becoming XC, then Academy. Doug, I think it's a question for you. Okay, start with Jamie, please. I'll start. I'll give Doug, you know, time to think about this one. <laughs> uh, I think there's some history. Um, but the, um, I agree. I think the effective accountability means we, can, we need to break past that corporate veil. We need to identify, you know, the same set of actors, you know, who was involved, how were they involved. Escaping liability, and I'm not speaking to a specific case, I'm speaking hypothetically here, escaping liability by changing, let's say, the structure or the location where the company is set up, to me means there's a failing in the you know, regulatory framework, and there's a failing in terms of international cooperation and in terms of mutual legal assistance, for instance. It should not be possible for an individual to change his or her name overnight and then no longer be held accountable for actions that he or she took before. So that's where uh, the role of governments in particular, and this goes back, I think, a little bit to the previous question too, governments have a major role to play in that regard. If you want to ensure that there's effective uh, accountability and oversight, then not only do governments need to have in place their appropriate domestic legislation and frameworks to uh, uh, deal with these kind of matters and sets of actors, be they security, military or beyond, but uh, secondly, there has to be a certain level of international cooperation, be it through mutual legal assistance, uh, some form of cooperation agreements or the likes, and transparency in terms of who's using what and for uh, what purposes. But more so, in my mind, there's also the element of how do you bring the information to the fore? Okay, so the big cases that we spoke about in Iraq came to the fore, and I saw in the chat there's also a question from Ashton uh, with regard to accountability. There's a lot of publicity surrounding one set of actors or a few companies operating in Iraq. Recently, there's been a lot of publicity around the Wagner Group and their activities in different parts of the world. But what is lacking for effective accountability is much more information and data and stories. And I think for individuals to be able to come forward in that safe space to bring forward examples and allegations against companies for wrongdoing, that's not being resolved. We can work on it, but there is, to go back to I think my initial point, that responsibility on the part of governments to allow individuals, to give individuals that space to come forward with those uh, matters and to have the judicial frameworks to deal with this efficiently. Doug, I hope I gave you enough space on that one. I just agree with you. Um, the only thing I would add that if you're holding, when it comes to accountability, if you want to hold an individual accountable, there are legal systems to do that. Um, in terms of uh, companies, the way you hold them accountable is, is financially. And uh, you'll see that companies, that, uh, for the U.S. all the time, they will penalize companies for a breach of contract or, or whatever else. Um, and the money matters. Uh, if a company cannot win a future contract, especially a security company, uh, it can be uh, a significant penalty. So if they, if they uh, are not doing things the way they're supposed to under the contract, under law, uh, you can still hold them uh, accountable. But if an individual is involved, and if it is a 
company executive that essentially allows or encourages um, illegal operations, and you can you can and should be able to hold them accountable uh, as well uh, in a in a purely legal sense. Can I can I add something quickly? Definitely. One of the reasons you see uh, strong states with strong militaries like Russia use mercenaries is because it's hard to hold them accountable specifically. And I think that for a very narrow sliver of this industry, um, uh, that is a selling point actually, which is why it's hard to find examples of the last five years of private military contractors being held accountable. See, on this way, I, yeah. I would like to link with what uh, Doug just said, uh, uh, money matters. So we have a question from Sean Go. Uh, does the panel think that the presence of PMC and the like undermine or bolster the legitimacy of the state they operate in, especially given the idea that the state should maintain a monopoly of legitimate use of force violence? Thank you. And Sean, if you want to go on with uh, this okay. one. Sure, I, I'll say something briefly and uh, others like Jamie may, may wish to add. I mean, in my opinion, um, legitimacy is a big word that people throw around a lot and it, it's a moving target. Um, and state, state action, I don't necessarily privilege as legitimate just because it's a state. And certainly if we look at Weberian's um, definition of what a state is, is that entity which has, well, he says a legitimate monopoly of force, then, you know, if, if that's, if that's the only thing you're looking at, you can make the argument, you can make your argument that, you know, it's, it's a dilution of that, legitimate, of that legitimacy. However, you can also make the argument that the state is extending its legitimacy through um, sanctioned actors. Um, my, my concern with that is that they may be your actors today, but tomorrow they may be somebody else's actors and they contribute, I'm talking about traditional mercenaries, contribute to the overall erosion of state monopoly everywhere. So it's a net negative. Thank you. When, when you was just quoting this, I was just recalling Machiavelli and the chapter of the prince. Uh, and basically he was just stating what you just mentioned uh, on mercenary accountability and switching side uh, quite rapidly. I don't know if uh, Jamie want, want to add something. Just a couple of small points. Maybe Please. one to um, as a, just a footnote to the previous question with regard to the Corbe uh, There's interesting discussions uh, presently before the Human Rights Council with regard to elaboration of a treaty. Um, I think got the title here on corporate responsibility, business and human. It's basically very much focused on business, on business and human rights. So very much a question of corporate responsibility in that regard. So I think that's something to be looking at going forward to see whether or not that particular treaty will see the light of the day and what it will look like. Uh, because it's, I think, the very first, so I think, real initiative that's seen some uh, success in terms of discussion, in terms of development, uh, in terms of text, that could point the finger to the question of corporate responsibility, uh, but very much focused on what state obligations are to ensure there is a level of corporate responsibility for violation of human rights. So look at that space, because in my mind, even though security contractors and military contractors are not specifically named in that particular document, they are uh, commercial private entities, and they could potentially fall within uh, the lines of responsibility and oversight as part of that supply chain discussion. So keep looking at that. The second piece, um, in my mind, the question of use of force, if I looked at, I was recently looking at, I think it was uh, the NATO's uh, strategic foresight out to 2050, and I think uh, the UK MOD document in that regard as well. There's a reality, uh, I think, check for all of us to take on board. There's a recognition by many governments that going forward, we're going to see security contractors, private actors, and a growing number of military uh, contractors operating in these sort of high risk environments, in these complex environments. I think the market is going to evolve in that regard. I think to fall backwards and think that the monopoly on the use of force is gonna fall back in the hands of state, goes back to something that Sean was saying earlier, that's unlikely to happen anytime soon. Uh, instead, we're gonna see a growth in the other direction. From the security piece, 
I would be very happy not looking at the military component. I think that, you know, any country that requires security, you have to ask yourself questions why they need security in the first place and what's lacking in that sort of system, uh, in that uh, sort of country setup. But I'm here in Geneva, for instance, and two days ago, I'm driving down the road. It's not a complex environment and the security guards move in the traffic. Now you're seeing security doing traffic as well. So why is it that the Swiss authorities have chosen to outsource the moving of traffic to a private security company? So you can see also how security companies have taken on different roles. But in terms of use of force, I dare say I would be more pessimistic than optimistic to think that states are going to maintain a monopoly on the use of force going forward. I certainly see there's going to be a greater interest in terms of the private side uh, in the foreseeable uh, decades. Thank you, Jamie. I see a, a raised hand uh, in the audience. It's Professor Abdullah Baboud, who was former colleague of us at MEI and now Professor of Wasida University. Abdullah, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. I, I, I have uh, two points. One is I want to give you a little break uh, so that uh, uh, you, know, you can take a breather. And the other thing, I want to uh, encourage others to ask uh, their questions directly. Um, but also, I want to relate this to the Middle East, if I may, and that is, um, of course, mercenaries have been used uh, uh, in conflicts, various conflicts in the Middle East. But what we are seeing now is not only international mercenaries coming and operating in the Middle East, but local Middle Eastern uh, mercenaries have now been recruited uh, to fight wars everywhere, you know, the Syrians, the uh, Sudanese and so on. With the ongoing uh, many crises in the Middle East and failing or failed states and the economic situations, do you see that this is, could be, this could, uh, you know, have some potential for growth? And what kind of implication will this have to the Middle East that's already facing lots of crises? I stop here. You can choose whoever wants to answer. We can kick it off. I think um, in any uh, conflict, pretty much ever, uh, it's almost impossible to isolate it to one single state. Um, the neighboring states uh, are always connected to the conflict, and it may just be um, ethnic ties or family ties or whatever else, but there's a lot of cross-border uh, exchange of personnel. Uh, and we saw that you see it certainly in Africa, you've seen it all the time. Um, but uh, in Vietnam, you, you had uh, the spread of the conflict. So I think that's actually just a, I hate to say, normal part of any conflict, but I think it's very, very common. If I could add to that and build on it, I, I agree with uh, your concern, Professor Babu, that we've seen this in the last 10 years where um, in the US involvement in Iraq, or Afghanistan, you had large private military firms who created or hired local subs, subcontractors to augment their contract. And then the private military company, the, the international one left, the locals were left and they sought new clientele. Others around the world are also imitating the model. I mean, the Wagner Group in some ways, uh, I believe is you know, the, taking some of the U.S.'s lead here and expanding it. And I think we're seeing others around the Middle East imitating the private military model and it's expanding. We're having a proliferation issue because, you know, if you look at, at Machiavelli and the Italian wars to, to you know, to, to use Alex here for a second, not that you committed those wars. Um, one of the problems we saw in a highly marketized force market is that mercenaries would sometimes create or elongate conflicts for profit. And uh, a world with more mercenaries is a world with more suffering. Now, just to be clear, I'm not talking about, uh, to Jamie's point, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a very small sliver of the market. And there's a lot more actors out there who are not participants to this market. But I do, I am concerned about the proliferation uh, and, the, and the localization and atomization of the industry. See, so, yeah, I will move on now with the following question from Joy Austin. Uh, 
Given the current state of affair in the world with COVID-19, what impact have you noticed regarding the security matters in given areas, specifically Middle East and Africa? Reference to stopped operation, medical concern, and so on. Doug, you want to start? Sure, this has been a huge issue in the industry. Uh, it means that in terms of international personnel moving back and forth, I mean, when you're doing private security abroad, it's a job and you, it's a nine to five job and you get vacations, you go home, you rotate. Uh, it's almost impossible to do those rotations now. That's, it's been a big issue. So you end up having people stay for much longer periods in the field. Uh, so there's all sorts of personnel issues there. The second thing is that uh, medically, if you have say several hundred uh, private security doing um, working at an extractive site, for example, what happens if some of them come down with COVID and they've been in contact with many other people? Uh, it means that you have to take them out of the uh, out of the pool of talent that you have available uh, for two weeks or whatever it takes for them to, to be cleared. Uh, it means um, any contact you have with the client where you don't necessarily have control over the client's uh, ability to prevent getting COVID means that there may be uh, other aspects. So it's a very difficult problem for private security companies. Just, to, I mean, um, I mean, great question. So we've been looking at this in particular, uh, working a lot with uh, quite a few of our members on this particular issue. And I think there's a number of points uh, just to build on what Doug was saying. The first is that we are seen in a, a, a number of countries, um, for instance, in Kenya, where the security companies have been named essential workers. In other words, they've become part of that kind of first response. Uh, they've been asked to help and support as part of the COVID-19 response. And that, of course, comes with a number of implications with regard to what they are expected to do as security personnel. And on a recent webinar we hosted, we had the examples given to us by a company operating out of actually Trinidad Tobago, so not Middle East and not uh, in Africa, where they spoke about the fact that uh, the security guards are now operating as health workers, literally. Um, so their good hand, their strong hand now is to hold the thermometer and they're also taking down all the data and they're letting people in. Or in South Africa, they've been helping out in hospitals and uh, carrying sick individuals into the hospitals. So there's been the big question in terms of the duty of care that's owed to security officers and to uh, sort of guards, in, uh, et cetera, who are now being asked to take on this role of you know, first responders in a broad sense, uh, who have been much more exposed to COVID-19 and to you know, potentially other illnesses as well. And then from that, the big questions with regard to, okay, you have the guards, but what about their families? They have to reinsert themselves back into the local communities. They have to go back to their families. So what about the protective measures for the guards and their families? as part of their own commute and when they reintegrate into the communities uh, after hours. The question of PPE and other protective gear that's required. I think a second point maybe I'll mention here is a question of technology. We are seeing uh, more and more security companies thinking about it's just not going to be feasible to uh, provide security or fulfill security contracts if we base ourselves only on physical presence of guards at the concessions or on the perimeters or offering the services. So instead, we need to look at substitutes. And this, I think, goes back to Doug's point as well. You know, if there is a, an infection within the guard force, you need to somehow put in, you know, use, you know, I think, Boris Johnson terminology, as a circuit breaker as such. And if you want to mitigate and limit the risks, then technology may have something to play in this regard. And with technology, we're now seeing questions being asked in terms of protection of data, artificial intelligence, questions on facial rec recognition, access to that information. And last point, uh, particularly important, we don't have data from other countries, but I think in a few, uh, in the UK, uh, a few months ago, the Office of National Statistics came out with some data with regard to the level of mortality across different uh, worker groups in the UK and security guards were one of the most affected uh, sort of uh, sections of the worker force in the UK in terms of mortality rate. And the question has been asked is why? 
what is it in their profile, in their work, and in their attributes that meant that they were more exposed or more likely uh, to have a, let's say, lethal reaction to COVID-19 as such. So there's a whole number of issues, and the discussion, I think, is barely starting right now. But certainly, we're seeing a morphing and a changing in terms of security services being offered, but also a greater risk as a result to the security providers. Yes, this question about COVID-19 was uh, on time uh, and it's open a lot of array of issue. But um, uh, Jamie, in your answer, you mentioned uh, the duty of care. We have just a question from Ashton, Ashton Tower, a question on duty of care. Has anyone formally considered the use of duty of care as an accountability tool for a state actor the troops are supported by intelligence, risk assessment, evacuation, layered medical support, diplomatic intervention, psychological support, and so on. At the end of the spectrum, anyone suffering damage in their line of work have a fair inferior level of care. A couple of well aimed liability suits will make mercenary work quite unattractive. And I think we already had this kind of suit if we were talking like before, Doug mentioned Blackwater, I think, uh, and, and the case uh, in the United States. But I give it the floor to you for your answer. Um, I guess I can just kick off real quick. There's something in, if you're working for the US government, there's something called DBA, Defense Base Act, uh, which basically says that any employee of a, of a contractor for the US government working abroad um, has to essentially provide health insurance, uh, government funded or government designed health insurance uh, for their personnel abroad. What's included in that, it, it's kind of a clunky system. It's not a great system, but it, it, it's important because it means that even a local employee uh, that faces COVID-19 or injury on the, on the job is actually uh, has some sort of protection uh, and uh, financial resources uh, should that happen. It's as I said, it's a clunky system, but I think the duty of care thing for any contract uh, is an important part of it. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure uh, Jamie can elaborate on that. Yeah, your conviction, uh, Doug. The, what I, from a duty of care perspective, I think we need to separate because uh, at the end of the question was issues about mercenaries. So maybe separate the discussion on duty of care from the question of attribution of responsibility and state responsibility in terms of if something goes wrong on your watch, ultimately, can you attribute that to a state actor in terms of responsibility, for instance, for mercenary activities in the broad sense. From the discussion of duty of care, which is a live one right now, in part linked to COVID-19, but even predating COVID-19, uh, but unfortunately only fairly recent. So a number of governments have been looking specifically at the question of duty of care as part of their funding of their respective programs as donors and the likes. And the question uh, in particular for governments has been, how far does your duty of care extend down, let's say your donor supply chain? How can you be sure that the organizations that you're funding uh, have integrated the right level of duty of care not only to their own personnel, but to all the beneficiaries of the aid that comes out of that program. And recently, we are seeing a growing interest by a number of these governments of the issue of, okay, duty of care also extends to questions of security. Security was an add-on in the old days, but now we're seeing much more of a focus being developed. So, right, so when does the duty of care end from, uh, with the client? Let's say the UK government finances an NGO in South Sudan to hire a local security company. Does the UK dispense of its duty of care when it's handed over the money to the local NGO? Or does that duty of care still carry on despite the NGO now being the prime and in charge of the implementation of the program? Does the uh, NGO, and I had discussions with a couple of NGOs actually oddly enough in South Sudan on this, about that duty of care. When they choose and select a security provider, where do they see the duty of care sitting with regard to their own personnel and the beneficiaries of communities they're trying to help? And interestingly, a couple of managers from these NGOs felt that as soon as they hired the security company, that duty of care then passed on to the security company itself. But we're seeing that process actually backfiring where donors, governments, and I think the legal community now started to argue, no, you can't simply delegate that duty of care. You still have a responsibility, even if it's residual. And we're seeing the duty of care discussion, uh, especially interestingly in complex environments from the humanitarian sector.
So the United Nations uh, and other agencies, humanitarian agencies, are very much focused on GGK, trying to unpack it and trying to figure out what does that actually mean in terms of responsibilities and potential liabilities. So it's a very live issue, and we're going to see it being discussed for months, if not years ahead. And COVID-19, I think, has simply exacerbated some of the questions. Sean, if you want to kick in. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, we have uh, a raised hand from uh, Dr. Asif Shuja, colleague of mine at the Middle East Institute. Asif, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Alex, for uh, giving me the opportunity. And uh, uh, actually, I have an observation. And uh, please pardon me if I'm taking the discourse uh, uh, in a very re reverse direction, uh, because uh, those who are Indians, uh, they have had hundreds of years of experience of uh, private security. Uh, the British East India Company, uh, who had ruled India for hundreds of years, uh, before 1858, 1857, it, there, there was a revolution. And after that, in 1858, uh, the British East India Company and the entire military was nationalized. Before that, at one point of time, the number of personals in British East India Company, which was a private military, had double the British Army. Okay. And uh, that is one instance. The other instance is that the American way of doing it. This is the British, this was the British way of doing things. And the American way of doing it is uh, that there was an anti competition law, anti monopolization law, through which uh, the Bill Gates company, Microsoft, you know, was attacked. Currently, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, his company is attacked. I just wish to ask the whole entire panel whether they are aware of this entire story. Uh, 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 because in my contention is that the, it is impossible to privatize the violence. It is entirely, eventually, ultimately in the control of the state. So whatever is happening currently, how much is the state control? you know, exercised by the United States in the entire mechanism of, of what we see here. Thank you so much, Alex. Yes, if... I think that the comment uh, on East India Company is very punctual because if I recall correct, uh, on a piece uh, uh, written not long ago by Eric Prince on the Wall Street Journal, he was quoting the East India Company as an example of efficiency and as a model to use in privatizing the conflict in Afghanistan in a more efficient manner. So I, I leave to Brooke the, to Doug the, the answer for this question. Thank you. I don't think I can fully answer it. I, on the, my background is actually history and the East India Company is pretty interesting. Uh, but it was set up as a commercial entity, not a security entity, of course. Um, and one of there's some uh, interesting academic research that I saw probably about five years ago, uh, and it looked at the correspondence between the headquarters of the East India Company and uh, the the sort of far flung bits of the East in, in, in this, uh, East India Company and uh, and the use of force and the use of uh, security and, and and soldiers and so on. And the correspondence is really interesting because it's it's pretty much the same everywhere at the headquarters saying, why the hell are you guys hiring soldiers or doing military things? That's not our job. We need, we need commercial, we need the money. Uh, and the reality, I think, and that applies to today is that the conflict is really expensive and security is expensive. Um, and actually a war is super expensive and it's not a very, um, it doesn't make much sense commercially. Uh, somebody pointed out in Sierra Leone at the height of the civil war there, they had a um, a rice crop that was worth uh, 10 times as much as the diamonds that everybody was fighting over. Uh, and, and that rice crop, of course, was, was constrained by the conflict that was going on. I mean, this is a, the reality. War is not a very, uh, and Sean's going to disagree with me, war is a very uh, expensive uh, operation and it's uh, commercially doesn't make much sense. Um, so what you see, I think, when you, when you look at the old mercenaries and stuff, it's a very niche uh, section of uh, the commercial world that actually gets involved in this sort of thing. I mean, you make far more money when you end a war, as we have seen. So uh, Sean will probably want to weigh in on that. I do, and I, I agree, Doug, uh, with you, uh, that war is very expensive. 
one of the problems that people always start war is thinking it'll be quick and easy and they end up being long and not easy. We've seen this from the Peloponnesian War to the US-Iraq War, you name it. I mean, I think the thing, I mean, I've done some writing and re about the, the British East India Company. And if you look at its 350 year history, um, it was hard to know who was controlling who, the Crown or the British East India Company. And it, it created the presidential armies, it created a, a military and armed forces that rivaled Great Britain's. And they used it for conquest to create and settle and control markets. And that's one way they profited uh, until the 19th century where they started getting into debt. There were multiple taxpayer bailout, bailouts. There was the 1857 Sepoy mutiny. And finally it went bankrupt after that. And in some ways the British East India, East India Company's downfall was maintaining its large standing militaries, its private militaries. Um, so to, that may be a lesson there. I'm not sure if there is. Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, with this, I think we can refocus uh, on the Middle East uh, and with something that uh, is very actual. And I have a question from RKRA. State-sponsored cyber warfare is a growing, increasingly common. As we become more reliant on technology, especially with regards to areas like satellite and drones, do you foresee private military company integrating technology into this service offering? I think absolutely, uh, without a doubt. And it's, you know, technology is like fire. It, it could be used to power a steam engine. It, it could also burn down your house. And um, how companies uh, use it, and I, I think, you know, certainly Doug would agree that companies can be a lot more creative, innovative, and efficient at using technologies. They don't need a global predator hawk drone. They could take some off the shelf drone and, and modify it. And again, it could be used for good or for evil. But I think it's interesting to note, look at Russia's experience. The Prigozhin who owns the Wagner Group also owns the internet research uh, agency, the Troll, the Troll Factory in, in St. Petersburg. And he uses um, the, troll, you know, the Troll Factory to cover for Wagner and vice versa in Russia's active measures. And we've seen this in Ukraine, in Syria and now in parts of Africa. So I do see a convergence of technology in this, in this industry, but that's not unique. That, that convergence is happening every, every sector of the world. So uh, Doug, if you want to add something. I don't really have too much to add. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, they do take advantage of, uh, of the technology. I think we've seen in the past, uh, they've helped to push along technology in certain areas, certainly in GPS, uh, miniaturization and ability uh, to track vehicles and things like that. That became uh, that was something that the uh, security industry uh, bought into in a big way, because you do need to keep track of where your personnel are to, to make sure that your vehicles are operating safely and doing the jobs they're supposed to be doing. Um, we've also seen it in, uh, in the larger industry, the medical services industry, uh, being able to have remote medical sites. And this is sort of pioneered in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq where you'd uh, have uh, clinics set up and you might have a medic in the clinic, not a full doctor, but they have access globally to medical services that they're able to tap into through the internet. So they can actually use, um, you know, look in somebody's ear or down their throat and that is being to a, a doctor or a surgeon in some cases uh, somewhere in the world. So you're getting the, a top level um, uh, medical coverage with with uh, basically very limited resources in the middle of nowhere. And we've seen that expanded now in the United States. You have a lot of these remote clinics in rural areas where you never could afford to keep a clinic or a hospital going. So the technology certainly is a big role in this industry and uh, certainly in cost effectiveness. Thank you very much. I think we are almost running out of time. So I just give the chance to our audience to ask the, the last question. And if there are no more questions, uh, I just would like to thank our audience for being here with us today. And most important, to 
thanks, extremely thanks our three distinguished speakers. And also, please allow me to thank the Middle East Institute uh, event and communication team uh, that supported us uh, all in the background. And without their support, uh, uh, today's event is not going to be possible. So again, thank you very much to everybody for joining us today, for having this uh, excellent uh, talk uh, about uh, what is uh, going to foresee, what we are going to see in the near future in terms uh, of privatization of the monopoly of force. Uh, there are so many new actors spreading around from uh, Libya, Libyan conflict. We have, as mentioned before, Syrian mercenary on both sides, Sudanese mercenary, hybrid slash private military from uh, Russia, uh, Wagner Corporation and so on, but also other new actors uh, like private security company, local private security company that stem out uh, uh, from the private military uh, uh, action in Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as uh, private security guard from, uh, from China. So I would like again to thank everybody for joining us today and looking forward to have your comment, your suggestion, and to follow us in our podcast. Uh, that we run every month, uh, Boots of the Ground, uh, together with Dr. Amir Malufti. Thank you very much, uh, and have uh, a good evening, a good night, and a good morning to you in, uh, in Washington. Hey, thanks very much, Alex, and thanks to your panel. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you.